She's having a wardrobe malfunction. Hi, I'm George the Antique Nomad. Come with me as I wander the country in search of valuable vintage, amazing antiques, and cool collectibles. We'll buy, sell, and trade at antique malls, shops, and shows, estate sales, flea markets, thrift stores, anywhere people go to find really interesting things that just aren't made anymore. So come on, let's go. Hey everybody, it's George the Antique Nomad. I wanted to take a break from packing for the next West Palm Antique Show because, oh, I've got a lot to pack. It's the big extravaganza, the biggest show of the year. And so I thought I would take a break and look back with you at last month's show because some really great things came and it is just the tip of the iceberg. This month's show is going to be huge, three times the size of the one that I'm about to show you. And the one I'm about to show you had amazing things. Some of them will be back, a lot of them sold. Let's take a look now. If you were a very wealthy little girl in Europe, you might have had this doll furniture with the porcelain tops and seats and backs. What a cute little set. It's got the table and three chairs and the parlor sofa there with the transferware of the courtesans. It is really something very sweet and special and would have been made likely in France around 1890 and this is several hundred dollars as you can imagine. These are very delicate little boxes made in France as well and these were made to be little scent bottle keepers to take with you. We see lots of these that are just little jewelry dishes but this is something really unusual. And then since we're looking at miniatures let's look at a bunch of Shelley miniatures. It may not show on your screen, but let me pull back and you'll see how small these really are compared. There's the little miniature teapot. These are all Demitas or doll size made by the Shelley Company in England, which went out of business in 1966 and is well known for making some of the most high-end, really well-made porcelain tableware pieces of its time. Kathy also has this really wonderful rug cellar. This is Royal Dalton Flambe. That is one of the most interesting pieces in the Flambe line that I've seen. She also has several painted porcelains in stock. These French pieces here, very popular around, again, the late 1800s, Lady in the Shroud. These typically sell for two to four hundred a piece, depending on the scene. For our Sterling fans, this little case has some wonderful pieces, including a Tussie Mussy, which is this thing on a chain. These were to hold little flowers in a little tiny vase and hold water, and you could wear them. That was a Victorian style that was popular. And then there's another fragrance bottle, also on a chain. Those might have hung on a Chatelaine style necklace. I believe this is by the Elite Company in Limoges. It is artist signed. You can see the signature there. Artist signed pieces can be more valuable, but what makes this really special is the serpents on the top of the vase. This should date sometime in the Art Nouveau era between about 1895 and 1910. I'm going to try to get around so you can see the whole thing. Now this would have been painted mainly on the front, but they always did a little bit of design on the back as well, because if you were setting this on a table in the middle of the room, like a center table, which a lot of houses had before coffee tables became the thing, then you would have wanted the design to show on both sides. This piece is likely to be German or Austrian, and look at the wonderful owl. This is going to be from right around the turn of the 20th century. Look at those great eyes. Owl collecting certainly is something that started well before the 1970s. And then these French painted porcelains, and she just put the light on for us. How nice. Look how beautiful she is. $13.95. That's quite large uh, for a painted porcelain tile. The woman in the garden with the roses. Just beautiful. And here's another one here. She's having a wardrobe malfunction, but she's very, very pretty as well. This one is smaller, but look at the look on her face. She seems a little bit sad, a little bit distant and ethereal. I, I just love that piece. This might put you in mind of Rodin. This is a wonderful bronze. It is called Du Jeune Spems of a Satyr. So two women and the satyr. And what a strong design that is. 
This is by Paul Silvestre, and it won a contest in Rome in 1912. So this is a fairly early piece for him. You can see the signature there. Just gorgeous. The detail is incredible. It is priced at $28.50. For modernist silver collectors, Jorgensen is probably one of the most desirable of the makers. And this is a wonderful salad piece in what they call the modified blossom pattern. Priced at $8.95, George Jensen Silver sells for big prices because it not only has silver value, but it has a cross-collectability between both silver collectors and modernism collectors. And then they have some really neat pieces here. In the middle, you see a French baby teeth and rattle. It seems like you might chop your teeth at pretty well on that, but it is something very unusual. 19th century, priced at $3.95. There's another baby bee teether and rattle in French sterling with the shepherdess at $4.95 to the right. And then you see this lorgnette, which are these folding glasses. And this has niello work, which is this blackening of the design so that you really get that dimensionality. And that's going to be from around 1870, priced at $1.95. So the middle piece is, um, is uh, Joseph Hoffman for Tonet. Yeah. And then the seats are attributable to Lloyd's Loom. Lloyd's I had no idea that they did anything chrome or any, I just think of them as wicker. Yeah. Now, uh, later they evolved into that. Into our tech. I guess everyone had to move yes. on as styles changed. Oh, that yeah. is such a wonderful set. And I'm so excited to learn something about them that I had I no idea to. about. Yeah. A lot of people have mentioned that too. There's also a French company that was making them like this, so they thought maybe it was French. Maybe they were French, uh-huh. Wow. When we got them, they originally had a um, green dog hide on them, because they were made for like industrial fields. You know, right. Places. So we took that off and had this nice seat. I, yes, I think it's much yeah, better looking than this. Sometimes the chrome gets off. Right, right, especially in Florida, it seems like pitting of chrome is a real problem. But oh, that's just wonderful. They're beautiful. Thank you. This is just a fun collection of little cart de vista. These are small size, and these are all children, 1860s to 1880s. After that, you start having thinner photo prints. So these are really fun. Mostly European, I think there's a few American in here. A lot of people like to collect these because of the way that they're dressed, and they're not really expensive. The 20 of them are selling for $85 for the lot. These French candlesticks are incredible. They're doré, which is a gold plating, and they are Louis XIV candelabra made in the mid-1800s during the revival of the empire. They're very much rococo because they're asymmetrical and they have the puti or cherubs at the base. I think they're just wonderful. And they are priced at $24.50. They're probably two feet high at least. Well, the dealer just told me that this company, WMF, which is a German company that I'm familiar with for Art Deco glass, is still in business as a cutlery maker today. This one has really interesting color and the spatter work design. It's almost a carryover from Dom Nancy and other French glass makers with this spider web like effect. Priced at $3.95. I think that's just a beautiful piece of glass and quite large, 18 inches. Well, my friend Brett has wonderful jewelry and we're going to show some of the better names in flower baskets. Flower baskets were a very popular motif in costume jewelry starting in the 1940s. Yeah, like you really were. This one is Duge. 12 cases. These are signed Hobe. That's a good name to look for in jewelry. A lot of them are Austrian and crystal. <laughs> Just and beautiful. He does get the greatest stuff. Now, in more modern jewelry that you might once in a while find when you're out thrifting or shopping, because some of this is closer to current vintage, is Kenneth J. Lane. And you can see what an interesting variety. There's several pieces of carved jade. They use coral and coral-like materials. They did a lot of seascape type 
designs, and those are popular here in Florida. But Kenneth J. Lane is definitely a name to look for if you're out there shopping for jewelry. And then these are some personal favorites of mine. There's Victims of Fashion, Elzac, and some other makers in here. These are various forms of plastic and lucite. This all started during the Second World War when rhinestones were not widely available and it exploded into a fun and colorful world of designs for us to enjoy now. And these are really big pieces that are quite prominent. Carving sets typically don't go for a lot of money, but if you see stag handle, that seems to be appealing to people, and particularly if you have scenic blades and presentation cases. This one is August Kuhlenberg from Solingen in Germany. A lot of the items like this are marked Solingen because that's the part of Germany where the cutlery was made. Here's another set here. They have an entire case full of these. Look at the designs on the handles. You have all the different kind of game. You've got rabbits and deer. I think we see an elk there running. And then look at the scene on the cleaver. They're really quite impressive. These were very popular from late Victorian times into about the 1920s. You'll see later sets, of course, as well. And I hope they'll be all right with me. We're a little before opening here. But as long as I don't get into their case, I think they'll let me show you this other set below in the case as well. A handsome Majolica umbrella stand here from around the beginning of the 20th century, priced at $235. Now, some of these, when you see these colors that drip from green to gold to brown are McCoy, but this one's finished better than a McCoy piece would be. So my guess is that that might actually be another company in Ohio, possibly Peters and Reed or one of the Zanesville companies. I don't see any marking on it to determine without further research. I have a thing about water coolers and I just realized I have a thing about water coolers when I saw this one and realized how many times I filmed water coolers before. And here's a wonderful one, the Birkefeld filter. This was made in Germany, Art Nouveau period. You can see with the stylization of the flowers and especially these calla lilies and the wonderful birds on them. Just beautiful. This is going to date to right around 1900 and it's priced at 695. I always like these late Victorian early 20th century frames as well and this one's especially interesting because it's a little larger and because it's Bacchus. I always think of wine when I think of Bacchus because he's got the grapes on his head there. This is a good price, I think, at $75. It's rather large and it's a different style. You usually just see ornate curlicues. Behind it, this piece here, and this is something to know, Jure did sculptural pieces that sat on tables as well, and a lot of them were mounted on rocks. There's the Jure signature. This is something to look for out there. It, they didn't just do wall art. They did sculpture that was to sit freestanding as well. So the little shipwreck boat with the sails on it is one of theirs. I mentioned in a recent video that I had a piece of sterling silver that was marked Rose Point and that the sterling makers and the glass makers got together and did the same pattern. Well, here is the Cambridge Rose Point in a wonderful cocktail shaker with the lip. And the lip is unusual to see on these. You can see how well it's polished and there's the same pattern that was on my silver in the glass. See right here the roses in this cartouche. I'll take a shot from this side. Maybe you can see it better in this champagne. This elegant etched glass from the 1930s and 40s is currently not as in favor in the market. It's beautiful, especially if you serve with it, if you put some sort of a liquid in it, your favorite cocktail or something that has some color, that pattern really jumps out. I think people will rediscover that eventually because cocktail and barware is popular now. These are 1960s vintage and yes there is a market for anything that shows parts of the body. It looks like we've got ligaments and a joint here and there is a foot. So this probably was from a podiatrist's office. Pieces like this typically sell for $100 or more now. This is a piece that people might not recognize. It's Yadro, and it's just a whimsical little guy here. This dragon with the pointed head. I have a friend who would love this, actually. And there's the Yadro mark. The colors are a little different. They do this brown to pink coloration as a matter of course in their production. But this one is not one I've seen before. 
I imagine he's priced under $100, but how cute. There's a very pretty dresser box with enameling and cranberry glass. Cranberry glass in the Victorian era required the use of 24 karat gold to get that color. This is a steamer trunk, and I really like steamer trunks because they're very efficient for display. You can take them to shows, you can use them in malls, you can use them in your house. You've got drawers for linens. This would have been something someone would have taken on a steamship or by train. You've got this area that folds out for storage. And then you have the drawers below, and then you have the hanging area over here. They're just a really smart idea. They sell for around $200. And I like to show this booth because I was across from this gal the first time I ever did a show here. And she's very sweet. She's in her 90s now. Her daughter and she do this together. She has a nice piece of weeping gold here, the double cornucopia vase. Most of these were decorated in Ohio by various companies. Next to it is a piece of old Paris porcelain. When you see this shape vase, typically this is old Paris. And it usually is not marked because these were made in the 1860s and 70s primarily. That's a very pretty piece too. And she's moved with the market like all of us. I'm sure that when these were new, being an antique person, she probably didn't think about them much. But now we've all moved on and this is 50 years old now. And it's only $20 for the controlled bubble Murano glass. These little pieces are Lennox, and they're Lennox with the jewels. That's the enameling on them. This is something that you see that's relatively contemporary, but really well made. And I find that I get about $18 to $25 a piece when I find these items. She has a whole passel full of the Whiting and Davis mesh purses. And one thing about these is that they would have various different class. Some of them were plain, but some of them were quite bejeweled and had different style to them. And those tend to be a little bit more desirable. She's using it as a display, but she actually says can be hung on the mirror underneath all of this glass. And it is in fact an English mirror from about 1940 with an interesting shape at only $25. Here's an Enid Collins purse. And this one's a little different because it opens up from the middle and it's a wooden box purse. It's a little darker stain than I usually see, but this is the money tree. It's a pretty popular pattern of hers. You see money tree one. She did another money tree style that was a little different. All these little gold coins stuck on it. And then this slides open. That's what's different about it. Most Enid Collins purses are not made this way. So this is an interesting piece to me. It's priced at 65, which is very fair because the condition is good. I like that. It's nice to see something a little different in something that you've been aware of and collected for a long time, or in my case, bought and sold. Stamp machine is $95. I used to see these at this show a lot when they were first taking them out of places, but now they've all pretty much started to go into collections. And then look at these neat boat models. These are quite large, as you can see. They price $250 to $300. Here's a different style of a pairn. The green glass is lovely, but what's really interesting to me are all these little pots around the bottom. Seems like it's more designed for what they were originally, where you would use them for condiments or something. I, I, I thought, and I don't know, that this is for flowers, but at the bottom maybe this for nuts and candy. Nuts and candy. Right. See, that's what that's I think what I too, thought. and that's more in keeping with what they originally right. were made for yes. back in the early yes. days. So. Oh, that's just wonderful. Yeah, I would say early 20th century. That's my guess. Yeah, and the green color in the glass is just nice too. Heavily decorated metal frames for the Torah were very popular in the mid 20th century. They of course existed before and some of them can be very valuable. This one looks like it's probably 1950s or 60s. Then you open it up and you have the Holy Scriptures in Hebrew and English. This one is silver plate with a lot of decoration. Israeli metalwork is really very good. It's something that uh, they were very accomplished in in the mid 20th century. And they're just beautiful. And they're actually pretty collectible and not terribly cheap. The last one I saw was priced around 200. Here are some really neat wooden carved pins 
Again, the wooden carved pins also came into fashion in the 1940s because of the Second World War. It was something you could do that didn't require rhinestones from Austria. It kept going through probably the 1950s, and there's just some really fun designs here. Lots of animals and critters, and then you see the use of lucite. My friends Shirley and Carl always have interesting things. This time they seem to have some neat scales, including this one, which is a pharmacy scale from probably sometime around 1900 to 1910 with the brass pans on it. It's priced at $3.85. They also have some interesting little scale weights. These are English, this little weight set here. These are ice cream or butter molds. Sometimes you see candy molds as well, but when they're hinged like this, they were a little tighter seal than the chocolate ones would need to have. These are all going to date to sometime in the early 20th century, and I love the different shapes. So you could have a mandolin or a rose. There's a swan and the shoe. These are a really fun area of collecting if you like kitchen collectibles. They look good in primitive displays. Here's another interesting balance scale. This one is quite tall and dished so that you could hang something in it up to five kilograms. And since it says five kilograms, we know that this one is European, probably continental Europe. A lot of these seem to have been made in Holland. This very tiny little ship's wheel is from a shrimp boat. Shrimp boats had to get into very shallow water, so they had a very shallow draft, and they would have been smallish. And so are the wheels. That's really something different that I haven't seen before, and that's priced at 185. And yes, fax machines, the Rico Fax 20. This is going to be 1980s when, wow, faxing was the big new thing. And yeah, old technology is starting to come back. They've got this priced at 58. The two dancers here are 1950s, and they have such a lovely style to them, and they are copyright 1951 Dorothea. So this is one of the small California pottery companies that popped up as a result of the Second World War cutting off the import of ceramics from Japan and Germany. 1951 was pretty much the peak of California pottery. There were 2,000 different companies making it then. By 1970, there were about 100 pottery companies left in California. These very small fireplace tools and screens were from boudoirs. If you had a little place, a small room, you would still need a small hearth because otherwise it would be very cold in there. So you'd have small fireplace tools for those rooms. This is priced at $198 for the set. And look at the little screen. It looks like a copper wash over brass. That's very pretty as well. This would be from about 1900. It's got a bit of Art Nouveau detail on it. And then also in copper is this big rendering kettle. That is a quite large one. We see them in cast iron a lot more than we see in copper because a lot of copper, again, was scrapped during the war drives. And this one is sometime in the early to mid 19th century. You can tell because a lot of this is handwork here. These rivets and the way they're made are not exactly perfectly uniform. So this is fairly early. Cranberry glass was very popular when I first got into the business, particularly enameled Victorian cranberry, and I think this shelf of pieces really shows why. There are some wonderful items here. This one is Mosier. It's beveled on three sides. That's a good way to tell, and it's in this Mary Gregory style with a white painted seam in the middle. This one, they said, is attributed to Mosier as well. I would say that's right because the beveling on the top seems to be correct. They would bevel the edges so they didn't chip. They said this one's also attributed to Mosier, and I think those attributions are correct. Prices on these are in the $300 to $400 each range because Mosier is considered quite high-end, but there is other cranberry glass made like this in the same time that's a little less expensive by some of the other companies. Just beautiful though. The fish scale on Herond is one of the things that is really popular right now. These floral pieces of Herond are very nice too, but I really like the fish net. The Cobra is really interesting to me. It's got 24 karat gold painted highlights. It's priced at 325. The bird behind is neat as well. 
these do tend to do very well in the marketplace right now, so this is something to see. Well, this dealer has some really interesting things that are a little different than we've yeah, seen before. Okay. Yeah, I think that's great, actually, out of Boston. And it is March 18th, 1793, and you can tell the yellowing of the paper is not yeah, as much as it would be now. Yes, and it's talking all about electioneering, so, uh -huh. yep, it started early and has never stopped. <laughs> Laws of Massachusetts published by authority. See, this was how everybody got their information. So if laws were to be established, you had to have it somewhere where you could say, look, it was in print, and even yeah, if most yeah, people were illiterate, then there you go. And this newspaper was not cheap. It was $3 for a year. That was plenty of money in 1793. This is a really cool piece. This is called We Return, and this is when the United States was able to go back to the Philippines at the end of the Second World War and liberate them from the Japanese, and ultimately the Philippines finally got their independence in 1946. This is an Italian artist, Tommaso Principe, turn of the century in style at least, impressionistic. They have this priced at 550. There's a nice signature there. Signatures can be obscure and hard to read, so there are sources for looking at quote-unquote illegible signatures and you're able to get some information from that as a lead. So look for that online or in old books that have signatures. You can get those at libraries in their reference areas sometimes. These prints are from about 1950. You have Sir Lawrence Olivier as Macbeth and Miss Vanessa Redgrave as Rosalind when she was very young. This little pot here is pre-Columbian. It shows evidence of having been buried because some of the polychrome has been affected by roots that grew across it. That's why you have these mottlings and breaks in the design. This particular piece is attributed to the Pakime Pueblo, which would have been in Chihuahua. This is a mammoth tooth carved by the Inuit in Alaska. And they have this priced at 400. They're all mistakes. That's a pretty neat thing to have found. Oh, life is mistake. And then this is a photo that is very hard to find. This is from 1959 when a very young Cuban premier, Fidel Castro, and his second in command, Ernesto Che Guevara, are sharing a laugh together in Cuba. This is by the Underwood Archives, and this is an original from 1959, and it's priced at $450. This is Margaret Meyer. I showed her display last year, so you can see a lot of this in the video from them, but she always has new stock. And these are items that were made in linen made of flax. These were grain bags from European farms. They are very popular to use for seat cushions, for table coverings for all sorts of things in farmhouse decor and it's just such a neat idea so it's fun to show a little bit of this again and they're not strictly printed with the signatures and information from companies that use the bags some of them are done with basic stripes of various colors i love florida highwayman art and i'm going to show some pieces that were not here at the show last year this is r.a mcclendon who's one of the original florida highwaymen it's such a great story, and it's so neat that they have come into their own. This is Sam Newton. He tended to do very bright colors, and sunrise and sunset scenes were a specialty of his. And of course, when they were rediscovered, a lot of them started producing again. So some of the newer pieces actually will have dates. Like this one is dated 1992. So that will tell you the difference between first generation and second generation Florida Highwaymen art. And of course, the first generation is a little more valuable. This wave is Harold Newton. Waves in a storm on the Atlantic coast. And then this one is Alfred Hare. Alfred Hare was the first to really make a big success as a Florida Highwayman artist. They were trained by a white man from Connecticut who wanted to do something to help aspiring black artists to be able to learn more technique and to 
be able to support themselves as artists and selling these by the highways is what they did. That's why the frames might look a little cheap to you because they were using what they could get. This very large one is another Newton piece. And then this one is Mary Carroll. She was the only woman among the highwaymen. And my mother and I met her when she did an appearance in St. Petersburg and what a lovely and gracious lady. She signed my mother's book and they had a nice conversation. My mother owns one highwayman and it's a Gibson, which I bought for her at this show several years ago when I first started doing the show. We don't see a lot of American dinnerware at this show, but this is one piece I wanted to show. This is by Red Wing. They really did a lot of fun mid-century designs. This one is Capistrano. You can see the swallow there. When the swallows come back to Capistrano is a very popular song. In fact, if you watch old Bugs Bunny cartoons, they use it in one of my favorite ones. This is the casserole dish, and this would be 1960s. They have it priced at $39. There was a time it would have sold for double that, so I think that's a pretty good price. I think $100 is a very fair price that's for it because. To be fair. Yeah, you don't see a lot of uh, Don Shepard designs. He designed there a lot less time than a lot of the other artists. Right. And yeah, that's a really neat Blanco molded piece. He did a lot of their molded I, I wear around then. The bear. Yeah, the bear claw is really oh, something. Oh, I love it. And the sunset, you know? Yes, yeah, that amberina, yeah, or I, I think tangerine they called it. Just beautiful. Yeah, I like that. And then these carved shells with the cameo. I'm always with the partial cameos, to. Yeah. yeah. And then this is a quartz crystal here. Oh, these are very pretty. How much are these? Well, uh, the biggest one is 100 the other two are 75 each. Yeah, yeah. Those are very good prices for what they are, and I like that this one's actually marked uh, having been uh, made in right. Italy, right. which I'm sure they all were, but they it's, all. Yeah, they but all it's interesting that one of them actually had the mark. Well, I'm not the only guy here with old cameras. This guy's got some really neat ones, and I like the fact that this one has the box. This is the Cine 8, so this would actually have been a movie camera for an 8 millimeter. And you can tell with that Art Deco box again, this is likely to have been one that was designed with the help of Norman Del Geddes because he did a lot of their Deco designs. It's priced at $50. Eight millimeter cameras don't really sell for a ton. Yep, I see that it's got everything there. That's great. These are early folding brownie cameras. These are 1909 to 1915 era. And you can see the red bellows. They price at around 90 and 100 and you've got a folding Hawkeye at $100 and then the brownie over here is $75. They're a neat look and yes you can shoot old film for them so if you want to shoot old black and white photos well you can learn to do it and you can use the old cameras to do it. These folks have some really interesting things. I started to... Hello how are you? I'm fine. Good. Yeah nice to see you too. I'm playing hooky and filming instead of selling because I figure this is my chance. <laughs> so this pottery bowl is a Coma Pueblo, and that's one of my favorite places. That is actually the oldest continuously inhabited site in the United States, and it's wonderful. It's basically a big bluff that they can defend from all sides, so they were able to hold off the Spanish invasion longer as a result, and they are still living there to this day. That's 135 for the polychrome. Interesting Confederate Civil War Bowie knife, and it's got the CSA mark out of New Orleans, 1861. That is a really unusual piece, and it is it's probably one of the most unusual knives you'll find. And I, I don't even know how many of them are in existence. I, I can't imagine that terribly high numbers were made in the first place either. You can tell all of that inlay is hand done. Well, they uh, lost the foundry three months after the war started in New Orleans. Oh, really? The Union took it over. It took oh, it over. interesting. So it was just a very, very short period of the war that they would have made this in the first place. Yeah, and I think wow. there's, from what I was been told, it's like maybe 300. I have a whole document on the history of the fellow who carried it. And really? All the information. Oh, there. how fascinating. What a great piece to have. That's really cool. I, I love seeing something like that that could be the only one left. Here's a nice little assortment of Van Briggle. I'm not used to seeing a ton of this in Florida because it was made in Colorado Springs, but it is popular everywhere. And I particularly like this plum color with the blue. The vase here is 200. The owl is really great. He's a single bookend. 
they would have come as a pair originally, but he's so neat, I would accept him as a single as well. A whole lot of Waterford in the box that's never been used. A lot of these are newer and millennium pieces, but there is a collector's market for these. Marquee is a pattern we see quite often. These I just got and I've been informed by various viewers, these are the Millennium line and these are the Doves of Peace etched on them. It's really well made, it's beautiful stuff and I did sell a piece here yesterday. This is Royal Albert and it shows people curling. Curling is a sport that you can do while drinking beer and smoking cigarettes I believe. So there you go, there's the ashtray. This Nodder Cat is a little ashtray made overseas in the 1930s. I love the way he shakes his head. View lighters were by Scripto, and here is the original panel. They were $5.95 each when this panel was made about 1970 or 75. Look at all the different varieties they were. Finding these individually, they cost probably $25 to $30 now in this condition. The whole thing together they have priced at $4.50. That's actually a very fair price if you were a collector to get the original display with it. Well, I've got to get back to packing, but please do come and see me if you are in the South Florida area. We will be at the West Palm Beach Fairplex on Highway 98. And the show is Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, the first weekend of February. It is the big extravaganza. There will be about a thousand dealers, two halls, and dealers outside as well. You'll find everything from really exquisite stuff like we've shown you in these videos to real bargains because we get a lot of people who come only for that show and they bring stuff from estates and to blow out. So if you're a reseller, it's a great show. If you're a collector, it's a great show. So come join us. If you're not able to come, you can see me on the social media links you see below. Check me out at theantiquenomad.com if you're interested in appraisal information. And if you are interested in memberships, we really appreciate that support. You can click join or check in the description for more information about what that entails. Thanks so much. We'll see you again somewhere in the world of antiques and vintage very soon. Bye for now. Thanks for joining me again in the fun and fascinating antique community here where online meets the real world. Please click the subscribe button below. Click the bell to be notified when new videos upload. Leave a comment below and hit thumbs up to like this video. Links to our online social media and our items for sale are in the description. This is George at the Antique Nomad. Bye for now.